I think probably everybody understands the, the need that we have to change what we're doing. I think campaigns, whether it's climate change campaign or anything else, we've got a lot that we need to do as far as changing the way we operate from a transport and planning perspective. And this advice that we've produced has been produced by a group of people across the spectrum, public, private sector, local government, consultants, planners, uh, transport planners and engineers and academics. So what we've been looking at is what the problems are, whether it's environment, climate change, uh, how to deal with the economy and congestion, but also the impact of changing technology, the aging population, the fact that m uh, millennials are encouraging enormous change in behaviour and the, the definite uncertainty of how things are going to go forward. So I don't think I need to ex stress to anybody the problems that transport creates. Those diagrams, I think these illustrate the sort of issues we're dealing with and climate change, major issues. Transport's at the heart of trying to resolve some of these problems and needs to see itself as the solution, not the problem. And at the moment, what transport is doing together with the planning service is producing places like this. That is new development that is only just being built and look at the quality of it. I'm ashamed that, it's, that I'm anything to do with a, a profession that produces uh, results like that. So they come from work done by the Transport for New Homes, uh, which did a whole series of case studies looking at the reality on the ground as to the sort of developments we're uh, permitting and allowing to happen. And they, together with other organisations, be it NICE or Sports England, are all saying we have to sort out the relationship between planning and transport and plan for people, not plan for cars. So we set the advice within the, con con the context of the current national poly planning policy framework because we don't think there's scope for that change. And practice, if you look at that document, it supports what we're trying to do. It's produced across a different variety of different bodies, and it's designed to try and help whether you're a professional or you're working in the community or you're a politician. It's designed for all parties. So we want to make sure that it was as easy to read as it possibly could, and it dealt with all perspectives as far as we possibly could. There are basically two aspects to the document. One is dealing with the strategic aspect, the other is dealing with the more practical implementation aspect. So we're looking for the whole link between the strategic level, whether it's regional, sub-regional, national, right through to the detailed level in terms of neighborhood plans and also planning applications and the way they're put into practice. And we're looking at it from the context of, of ensuring that every part of that chain works together, works consistently and coherently, and takes full account of all the views of the different parties, and that it is led by a vision that everybody agrees. So creating that vision is absolutely essential. And we believe that a vision for a place that's designed around what people want now and in the future is the core at the heart of what we need to be doing. And then once we've got a vision which is collaboratively owned by all parties, the stakeholders, the professionals, the politicians, etc., then we can plan and do a route map, a public transport map even, network, to deliver that particular uh, vision. So we need to set out what we, what we want, what we want to be like, and what the measures are that we have to take to achieve it. We need to ensure that within our local plans and our transport plans, that we have strategic policies that set out things like accessibility levels and mode share targets, if we're going to deliver that change in vision and make places that people want to live in rather than the ones you saw earlier. It has to be, of course, based on a very clear evidence base, and that's critical. And that evidence not only includes transport, but all aspects that are affected by transport and other things, be it people's health, be it it's the facilities that are available, the climate and pollution levels, all of those sort of things need to be part of that evidence base. And transport has to be integrated from the beginning. It tends to come in much too late. And if you look at the way that uh, some work done by Professor Peter Jones has produced. The way you look at a vision, whether it's a car oriented place, a mobility city or a city of places, makes a tremendous difference to the factors you need to take into account and how you can deliver a quality of place. What we've tended to do 
is deliver car oriented cities and car oriented villages. We need to move to cities of places and villages of places and people. So part of that philosophy is abandoning the current methodologies of predict and provide. If we carry on doing transport assessments that predict road movements and then provide them, we will never succeed in securing a different vision. We have to look at the wider issues about what we want to achieve and how therefore we decide what we want and we then deliver it. We don't just predict and deliver it. And that has to be an iterative process and built on scenario testing different deliverability and mode shared targets or different approaches to the sort of place that we want. One of the things that underpins all that is, the, is taking the positive elements of the National Planning Policy Framework and using that not as a negative but as a positive. And that whole process has to be iterative. And if we take that approach to delivering a vision and build that into the local plan and relate that vision to a geography that makes spatial sense for everybody, not just around local government boundaries, then we can ensure that we can have a planning policy aligned with local investment strategies, aligned with transport strategies, building and using the evidence, whether it's health, environment, demographics, and improve the quality of life for everybody in terms of accessibility. What we need to do in the local plan, therefore, is ensure that we map and plan for all networks. Most local plans, for those that are familiar with them, have road networks. They virtually never have public transport networks, uh, cycling networks and pedestrian networks built into the local plan. That's what they need. There should be an integrated network, not just one mode. One of the other main messages from the work we did is quite often we produce documents that might be very good in themselves, but they don't get delivered. They are put on a shelf and then in a sense used occasionally for perhaps development con management, development control purposes, but they are not delivered as a whole. One of the fundamental recommendations is we need to ensure we have a delivery body that looks at the plan, that's a collaborative body across all the key agencies. They produce something called an infrastructure delivery plan linked to the local plan and then they ensure through positive action that the plan is delivered and managed and monitored as it goes along. So it produces, it's a live document that's actually being delivered. Um, as I said, we need to actually ensure all of this is evidence-led. Uh, and so we need to ensure we look at all the key factors that are relevant to the community and the people that we're planning for. And we tend not to do that. We tend to be silo-based, looking at very limited a range of uh, subject matters. So part of the philosophy of this approach is doing scenario-based planning with multi-criteria assessment. And by that I mean looking at different factors, whether that's health, whether it's pollution, whether it's climate change, and putting the whole lot together in a totally integrated way and testing what's going to be the best vision for deliver that place. Recognizing fundamentally that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We cannot predict tomorrow because the changes that are currently taking place today are so profound that actually we need to devise something that's built on accessibility. So looking at accessibility at the core of what we do, whether it's digital accessibility, spatial accessibility, or physical mobility is core to actually deciding the way forward. And that's work done by G Professor Glenn Lyons, who also looked at the whole issue of uncertainty and how to plan for uncertainty, looking at the, the P's as it's uh, listed, it, whether everything from preposterous right there through to preferable. And that's part of the assessment we need to do. So managed developments need to reinforce the vision. They need to look at alternative solutions to the problems that we're trying to do deal with. So we have the optimum solution and we need to do it in such a way a way that is supported by the planning inspectorate and by the government who need to give much more weight than they do at the moment to the delivery of a local plan that is really sustainable long term and in the future. So part of what we would suggest uh, local authorities need to do is within their local plans and strategic plans is ensure they define for their local area what is significant and severe as a way of dealing with the national planning policy framework 
looking at accessibility levels and building that into their local plan to ensure they can deliver it and ensuring they're set up an accountable body. So this document was published in August. We are seeking to impact on the forthcoming national planning policy guidance. Parts of it have already been published, like on design, but the, uh, there is a section on transport that is forthcoming at the moment. No doubt now we'll have it to wait till after the election. Um, but I think we need to be looking at that. We're also in discussion with various bodies, including the government, on the dissemination, capability building, and education strategy that needs to go with this change in approach. And it is a fundamental different change in approach. And it's not necessarily going to be easy, but it's actually not rocket science, it's common sense. And surely we can do it, I believe, quite clearly. We have all the tools that we need. Thank you very much. Hi, right. Thanks for that, Linda. That's um, excellent. Right. Any questions or comments? We'd really love you to engage and ask something that's on your mind. Anybody? Right. Here we go. I've got somebody at the front. Linda, are you? Hi. Tom Perry from Design Council. Um, I, I think this is really important work. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you've said. Um, the new national design guidance for the MPPF, I think, is a really important document which sets out national design principles. It does include transport and movement, but not in the, in the level of detail uh, that a lot of local authorities need to actually, um, and designers need. Um, so I suppose, what, what's, what are the barriers you can see in terms of getting transport engineers and transport planners to think in this more connected, collaborative way? And how? And what? What is the? What is the key next stage? Is it education? Is it? Is it uh, more resources at a local authority level? Thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> Cheers, Tom. Um, right. I think. I mean, what I would describe it is. I think what we've got in the advice is a picture of a jigsaw. What we therefore need to split that jigsaw up into a whole series of pieces. There are lots and lots of pieces. Um, dealing with one of the elements of the pieces, we've got to disseminate so people know the advice is there, which is what we're currently doing. We then need to build capability, uh, in whether it's capability in engineers, transport planners, planners, politicians, the community, all of those sectors need the capability of looking at something differently and finding different solutions. So that's a piece of work that we're currently doing at CIHT and hopefully with the Department for Transport and the Ministry as well. Um, so we, that's going to happen start next year, but that's a long t term strategy. We're talking about at least two, two plus years, I think. We also need to ensure from an education point of view that people coming into the professions, all of those professions, are actually trained from day one in the right, to the right, in the right way, not using old practices. Another element we need to deal with is stopping people now using old practices that have been superseded many years ago. Design Bulletin 32, good example, but there are lots of others. So I think one of the things that lots of people have to do is stop that happening government and local government as well as the private sector and one of the things we need to be doing I think as well is getting the national policy guidance right, getting the inspectorate to work towards understanding these, the integration and the importance uh, of the integration of planning and transport, not doing what they're doing at the moment which is saying transport is nothing to do with us. <laughs> so I, 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 it's lots of pieces of jigsaw I think but resources money people with the right skills is fundamental to all of that but getting the right decisions out of politicians is also fundamental and we've got a slight hesitation on that at the moment <laughs> sorry just to add a, a comment really I, I, I think from somebody who comes from a highways background and work with Linda and watching how this developed the really positive thing is about how the ministry and the department are starting to talk properly for the first time ever since I've been involved in this issue and actually it's a really positive sign that something can happen so I think there's a lot of work to do but we're on the right track. I think evidence of that is that as part of the Transport Planning Society's Transport Planning Day campaign I we've had uh, Lillian Greenwood speaking at the initial event 
I've got both the DFT and the Ministry speaking at the final event on the platform, notwithstanding the election, I think. Um, and also the um, judging of the awards, the People's Award, was made by the Director General the DFT, the Chief Planner in the Ministry, as well as two other people. So they really are working together and they understand this agenda at the moment. We just need it to carry on and be reinforced.